Before I introduce you to our special guest for season four of Thriving in Construction, the podcast, allow me to share my thoughts about life for a moment. Life always surprises us with events we don't expect. Some of them make us happy, like when we find a $20 bill in the closet, but many of them don't, like when we miss a flight because the security line was too long. Sometimes, things we don't expect can be much worse, like getting sick, losing our jobs, or even worse, losing a loved one. Of course, these kind of events can be very painful. Life is full of surprises. I know you're aware of that truth. And I guess that is the only constant about life. Surprises, challenges, and unexpected life events. But the way you deal with them is what counts the most. In these challenging times, you must rely on your ability to think outside the box and find solutions. And our guest for today is I know she's famous and most of our listeners already know her down here in Florida. She's Dr. Barbara Sharif, Broward County first black female mayor county commissioner and president of Florida Association of Counties, where she represented all 67 counties in Florida. But life threw at Barbara a very unfortunate event. She lost her beloved father to gun violence, and because of this tragic event, she was forced to work at a very young age. I will let Barbara tell you the whole story about it and its connection to her success. Please help me welcome our guest today, Dr. Barbara Sharif. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for your presence, and thank you for the time that you dedicate to our podcast. We have a very, very special guest here. I almost don't believe that she's here. It's a, uh, it, and it just so hap- it just happened so simply. I met Barbara when I was starting my company in the recession. Just, I, I had, I had obtained an award from the SBA and I, I remember seeing you and I, I saw myself like most business owners when they start. So you see yourself so little, so little, so little. And, uh, and today you're here, not because I am bigger, but because I think we're all one. And there's a, there's a plan, there's a purpose for yes. our meeting. I'm very, very grateful for the time that you have taken. I, after speaking with you a little bit more now, I admire you even more for what you have accomplished as a, as a woman, as a professional with your business, and also as a politician, as a servant to the, to the community. So I am very grateful for you to be here, and I hope many of us can become some 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 of the things that you have already done in, in life. We can we can do more of that. Thank you for sure. being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's humbling to be in your presence, especially because you remembered something I didn't, which was that we met so long ago, but we were both at a time where we were really starting new endeavors and uh you starting your business and my business um was starting up as well so uh, it's i think we've come a long way yes 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 and i want our listeners to become familiar with you i know you're pretty famous in in florida but some people are not from here so can you please share with our audience uh who you are your background tell us about your business also because we started from scratch and uh, where is the journey in your business today? Give us some information about you. Okay. So first, I'm a doctor of nursing practice. That's where the doctor comes in, Dr. Barbara Shree. And I've been in nursing now, oh my God, I'm going to age myself, 30 years. And I started off at uh, Jackson Memorial Hospital School of Nursing. And my passion for nursing came early on. I'm always the one that patches people up when I was little, get a band-aid for my brothers. I come from a family with eight siblings. And so my love to help people came from the fact that I had such a big family and I was always leaned on for support. In my personal life, I'm a mother. I have three girls. I have two girls in college, one in high school. And both of my daughters that are in college are looking to pursue education in the medical field um, as doctors. And, uh, you know, when I decided to get into elected office, I had been in business for about six years. And 
I am the one that's at the PTA meetings and at the community meetings that's talking. And everybody said, oh, Barbara, you're always advocating for something. You're always uh, passionate about what you're saying and what you're doing and about helping people. And you should run for office. And so my being in politics was purely accidental in my opinion. But then after I got into politics, um, which I've been in elected office for 13 years, I thought, well, I've been really good at helping people and it makes me feel good to help people. And this is the way that I'm going to give back to the community and make everybody um, better. And so, you know, you can't please everybody, but politics was just one way of me giving back, you know, from, you know, stopping the red light camera issues to health care, to senior care. So I just, I was very privileged to be able to be elected to the Broward County Commission, but also be nominated twice to be the first African-American female mayor of Broward County in its 100-year history, and then to go on and represent the county on a statewide level as Florida Association of Counties president. So all of these things that I did in my career were kind of stepping stones to a bigger path and um, a greater opportunity to serve. And so that's pretty much where we are today. And your heart has been in, in giving pretty much in your in the history of your life because also the business that you started. Why did you start that business? So in 2001, I decided that I wanted to start a home health care agency, and that's more in honor of my brother. So I had a brother who was severely disabled he had cerebral palsy, he had um, seizure disorder, and multiple medical problems. And I grew up with people telling my mom, you know, there's no help for him. You know, you should start planning a funeral because the at that time in the 70s, healthcare wasn't like it was today. Today you can have a child with disabilities and there's plenty of resources, but back in the 70s, no. So I grew up helping my brother, helping my mother, and my passion for nursing grew, and that's one of the reasons how I got into healthcare, is because I wanted to help kids like my brother to have a better life. And uh, my company, South Florida Pediatric Home Care, uh, all that's what we did. We took care of kids that were using machines to breathe, kids that have 30 medications in a day, seizure disorder, really major medical problems, and um, that was my specialty. That this is what I, along my life, uh, I have noticed that in reality, the, the, what happens to us that sometimes well, the biggest problem is, is really what triggers us to start these new journeys, this new business, to actually impact other people. You, you ask yourself, well, if I'm suffering, if I'm going through this, then there must be many more other people that are doing the same. So I really commend that because there's bravery. And, and I see that you have break them all in a lot of ways because many people say, well, I can't do this because I have a business or I cannot be the one doing politics because I have, uh, I don't know, how do you do it all? And, and I'm, and you're a fantastic mother. And, and how do you do that? Be all, all these roles? You no, know, first of all, I, I always joke around. I have a planner and I, I write everything down because everything is on the schedule, but you know, for me, all of these roles are so different and they're so um, dependent on each other. Like, I want to set an example for my girls, for my kids to know that anything is possible. You could be whatever you want to be. And I think that as girls, when we grew up, it was certain professions that we were supposed to go into. And then we couldn't think outside the box. Like, in the 70s, to think of a female engineer, it was like, what? That's a male-dominated profession. And so the same thing as a, a, as a female business owner, um, my mother really encouraged me a lot to get into business. So my mom is a retired English teacher. She taught elementary school English. And she had been retired for about 15 years when I lost my father. My mom had not been in the workforce. And... Um, you know, my, my wanting to do more came from my desire to kind of show people that 
you know, bad things might happen, but good can come out of it. And I wanted to keep going and do the things that my parents had taught me over the years to do to help other people. And so we, we, um, we had some challenges growing up besides my brother having cerebral palsy and have, and being sick all the time. Um, I lost my father at the age of 14 to gun yeah. violence. Yeah. To gun violence. Yes. And now gun violence has become so common in America. It's like every week you hear about a shooting and people tend to become numb to that and think that it goes away. But for me, when I was 14 and I lost my father, it changed my entire life. I came from a, a family where we were comfortable. I was daddy's little girl. So I was the fourth girl. I was right before all the boys and I was the baby. But my father and I had a special relationship. I used to follow him to work every day. Um, I, he used to show me about business. And I think that's where I got my entrepreneurial spirit from is because I followed him while he was negotiating. He owned a women's really? clothing business and he was wow. negotiating the price of the clothes. And I would follow him everywhere. I would sit in his truck and I would stay behind him all day long. And my mom would be like, drop her home, drop her home, you know. But I got so much out of that time with my father because I was able to learn about business, learn about how he made things work. And I was going to go to college no matter what. And that was my parents' goal for me. And so when I lost my father, that kind of changed. We went through foreclosure. We went through struggles. You know, we lost our house, our cars. And um, I had to go to work at 14 years old. And that was really different to say the least. I mean, like what 14 year old goes to work because they want to go. I had to go to work and um, to make a living and to help my mom. And so I think those things just kind of molded me and changed me and made me want to be not just better, but also serve people. At a high, higher level. Yeah. And um, when you... I'm sure there was a lot of pain in your in your house. At that, I mean, I can, I think about it and I and I feel it. So, so as being a 14 year old, in that you receive this news, your father is no longer around. When you have this this relationship with him, thank God you spent so much time with him. You right. made out of 14, well, other people <laughs> probably make I don't know 50 years because you 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 value that relationship. What went through your head? How did you, how, why didn't you, you did not become angry? Uh, why did, it didn't change your heart, who you were? And some people are, we see this news and have this experience, yet they totally go an opposite way. They, they, they dwell on the anger and, and the revenge. What did you do to forgive? So in my household, um, I was, I was raised in a Muslim household. And in that household, uh, the way that it works in the community is you cannot hold those things inside of you because it's unhealthy and it, it, it makes you negative, right? And my parents believe that, you know, bad things happen to good people, but you cannot allow something bad to consume you. And so, yes, I'm a victim of gun violence, but I did not want that to be all that I was. And so when I first found out the news about my dad, I was terrified. I think fear was the thing I felt the most because there had never been a day that I came home that my father wasn't there, that my father wasn't supporting us. He was our primary source of living. And he was the one that encouraged me with my mom to go to school and it was just like my family was torn apart and the financial destruction and the disrepair that occurs when you lose somebody like that, that's so important to your livelihood. It's tra it's traumatic and it's scary. But what I refused to do was to be victimized over and over again. And initially when we went to court, I was with my mom and I was with my brothers and sisters and we were angry. We wanted justice. 
And justice wasn't going to solve my problem, which was poverty. I was now taken from a middle class life into poverty. And so whether I got justice in that courtroom or not, it made no difference to the outcome of my life. I could only make a difference to the outcome. And so I decided I was going to work. I worked three jobs. I put myself through nursing school. Uh, I made sure that I helped my mother to keep a roof over the head for my, my brothers because I have four brothers that were younger than me. And I just stayed focused on the fact that that was not going to become who I was. I was not going to be just be a victim of gun violence. I'm going to be a survivor. I'm also going to be successful at being a nurse. And um, I kept going, and I thank God for that, and that's why I'm here today. Yeah, you, you didn't allow... You were not a manager of your circumstances. You you created your life the way you, you wanted. You and a lot of it is just focus, right? You could have focused on that and made the decision of to focus on what you couldn't control in the past. Instead, you did totally you went the other way and it's been rewarding and I'm sure fulfilling. I think the best one when um I was so busy at completing school. I got six college degrees. And my mother says, you're a professional student. That's what you are. So I said, well, mama, I was so scared to fail. I just kept going. And so when I look back at it and um, my mother kept saying to me, it's okay. You know, you don't have to keep doing all of these things. I mean, you're very successful. Why do you keep going? And I remember... My business was doing so well, but I went back to school to get the doctor of nursing practice because I was like, no, I always wanted to be a doctor, so I want to finish. So I did, and now um, the joke in my family is like, okay, well, now that you have the doctorate, what other degree are you going to go back, <laughs> back for? But I just feel like um, the opportunities are there, and I just want people to know that you may, you may have to work three jobs, you may have to sacrifice some things, but you can make it. That's beautiful. And and in a lot, we align because um, I believe the construction industry is a channel for people to have a different life. I believe our industry can give people the opportunity. So how do you, I mean, you've been in politics, you've been in, in government. You have been in charge of budgets. You have been in charge of decisions, in charge of people. What's your, what's, how, what's your opinion about construction? So for me, as uh, I said in elected office, the construction industry is a very lucrative industry, not just for people who work in it, but people who own the construction companies. But one of the things as minorities that I believe that we struggle with the most is access to capital. Because financing is very difficult. I think the lending system has been stacked against us for a long time. Um, that access to capital is prohibitive for us because we are not sure of the financial documents that have to be turned in. Sometimes it's tax returns. Sometimes it's projections. Sometimes it's other things. But I think that in our community, there needs to be some type of a mentoring program to help people to understand how to gain access to capital and also how to complete the financial documents to make your company's portfolio look as strong as possible. And the second thing that I thought that I experienced a lot as an elected official is minorities missing out on bid opportunities because they weren't sure of how to, one, get certified as a vendor, and two, how to write the bid proposal so that you get ranked better and you get the contract. And so those are the areas where I feel like construction for minorities and that we have struggled. But I also see the hope in it that if we could get those little things together, yeah. that um, our community would do better in the construction sector. Yeah, I, I agree. We, there's, so it's, it's the, the problem is that you need, you are most of the time, it's a risky business, so you're required to have experience in order to get this project. So people say, oh, how do I get here if I cannot, how do I do it? And so that, it, it is a, it is a, there is a struggle and there's the capital that, as you described. And the bonding, like we, in Broward County, the bonding was keeping a lot of people out. They were, they were operating as subs on contracts and 
they have been operating as a sub for 14 or 15 years, but because they were always subs, they couldn't get enough funding to cover the project. And so what we did is we eliminated the funding requirements on many of our projects so that at least it would give minorities and small business opportunity to thrive. And that's not the case everywhere. But um, so I think that that's another area where governmental entities and elected officials can work harder is to relieve some of those bonding requirements and also give the classes for people to compete. And then the more I talk to you, the more I see how you reinvent yourself. I mean, you are an expert at reinventing yourself. I mean, all these studies that you do, I don't know how many degrees did you get, but in, in, in that process, in that journey, you decide to become an elected official. And now you're the mayor. I, I, how do you do that? How do you, <laughs> what, what, I mean, you get there and then all of a sudden you have a new focus, yeah. right? Because one thing is to want to be something and another thing is to get there. And now here I am sitting and I'm the mayor of a pretty large community that it has, that has needs. And now you have a ton of people looking at you. You're not only that, I'm managing an administration, but it's also the pu public servant. That, I know that's not an easy job because I, I used to be the, the head of construction for the city of Fort Lauderdale. So I'm, I was more handling the construction, but there's a lot of the needs of the, of the people that you actually hear. Oh, my glasses fell. So how do you, you wake up and now you're the mayor. What are the three things? I always ask, ask three because I know there's a lot. But in, in looking back, what are the three things you focused on? And if you had to do it again, if you had to advise someone that is going to be in that role, whether it's a mayor or in, as a public official, having the experience that you have in the private sector, what are the three things that made you successful in that role? And what would you do differently or better? So the first thing I would say is um, when I was elected to office, I had one idea about it. I thought, it was one way. And when I got there, I realized that some of those ideas I had to change a little bit in order to make them work. The first thing was I am a person that I am completely blind to political party, but I had to learn that that means something for other people. For me, I was in business. If I had an issue, it was an issue. Um, my job was just to find a solution, just like you, right? You get up every day and you say, I have an issue on that site, I'm going to solve it. You're never thinking, oh, it's a Democratic issue or it's a Republican issue. So I had to learn to have, show other people how to think the way that I thought and to gain that trust. And so that was critical in all that I was doing as mayor. The other thing that I had to overcome which means, by the way, yes, influencing. Yeah. In how do you influence from a place of of love, gratitude? How do you influence so that we get done what we need to get done? Right. It's about gaining respect. Gaining. Respect. At, at the core of of the influence was respect factor. So I think when people got to know me, they were like, "Wait a minute, Barbara Sharif is a little different. She's not coming to me saying." I'm a Democrat. This is a Democratic issue. She's saying, I have an issue and I need your help. And so I approached every issue that way. And the hurdle that I had to jump, which I think many women have to overcome, is people underestimating your talent and your ability. I was one of those people where when I went into the political arena, men oftentimes would say, oh, you know, she can't do that. Oh, it's a woman, you know, or, you know, they would say, well, my friend is a guy and he's been doing this for so X amount of years. And I think they underestimated me in that respect. And I remember I was mayor and Hurricane um, Irma hit. And, you know, when Hurricane Irma hit, we were in the county. We had no power. The, the, the trees were in the roads. The roads were blocked off. The food was stuck in the port. The gas was stuck in the port. And I remember sitting at, we have a room. It's called a situational room. And I'm sitting at the table. And everybody's kind of looking at me. And I was like, we need to shut 
the, the county down. We need to implement a curfew. And then we called in the National Guard. We called in all of the people from the county that we could call in to clean the roads. And we built, we got a path from the port into the cities. And then we would do distribution at night. Now, for those of you who don't know, Hurricane Irma destroyed the power grid for Broward County. And so there were people that had power for four, without power for four to 11 days. We had deaths as a result of it. And I had to figure out a way to get that gas and food and everything into the community. Because remember, for hurricane preparedness, we tell people, prepare for three days. And so during that time when I was making the calls, I was getting from the media a lot of calls from men, mayor, male mayors, saying, I don't agree with Barbara. You know, she made a curfew. She shut down this and she shut down that. And I don't agree with her. And in that moment, I had been in the emergency operation room for so long and trying to figure these problems out. Health care was an issue, getting people medicine. And um, I said in that moment, they have the responsibility of maybe 100,000 lives. I have the responsibility of 2 million. And I have to make decisions that are not always going to be popular for them, but it's decisions that's going to help people to live and help us to get through the, 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 the crisis better. And I always took that to, to heart in everything that I did. And so when we got through that crisis, 14 days into it, we finally were able to open up normally and operate in Broward County. And people kept coming saying, well, I, I what, didn't agree with you at first, but now I agree with you. You did a good job. And I think the only way to overcome it is to show people. You got to show them better than you can tell them. And that was what I did in that moment. And the other thing that I accomplished in that moment was I, def I, I did the statistical analysis for my doctoral paper in the emergency operations oh. center. <laughs> That's how I got, I graduated with my doctorate. <laughs> I was in the emergency center and I was doing homework in between what I was doing because um, my degree, my doctorate, I was finishing online and um, my college was in Pennsylvania. And so I, they didn't have a hurricane. I still had homework due and I was running the county and everybody kept going, what are you doing? What are you doing? And I'm typing, typing, typing. What are you? I said, I'm doing my statistical analysis for my doctoral thesis. And they looked at me and said, when do you sleep? Yeah. Never until I'm finished. <laughs> Married to the mission. Yes. Married to the mission. So yes. what, what did it feel to be a uh, black, you know, African-American female in Broward County, mayor of Broward County. And I know you're also the first black female president of the Florida Association of Founders. So what, what is it? How, tell me about, not, not so much what it feels, but w what goes through your head when, you're, when you are receiving these uh, confirmations of who you really are, right? Because it really is not the color of our skin that defines who we are or our race, our gender, right? But sometimes... We have to go through stuff. Yes. So for me, in my mind, I'm always saying, I can't fail. I can't fail. Failure is not an option because I'm representing women, minorities. I'm representing on a level where people expect failure and I can't fail. And so in my mind, that's all I was thinking is I got to get out, get this situation taken care of. It's got to be done right. And I have no room for error. And I think in all of that, when I looked at the people that I was representing on a statewide level, they came from small counties, medium counties, large counties. They were Republicans, Democrats, and independents. And I thought, how is it that I'm going to get all of them to work together with me, the Democrat, right? And what I did is I expanded all the boards I said, if you want to work on something, I'm going to let you work on that. And when I went through, I assigned them based on what they wanted. We had one of the most successful legislative sessions ever in the history of Florida because I did that. Because I said, I want to be inclusive of everybody. 
So when we had an issue, we stuck together. And that was what I learned out of that was inclusivity will breed success no matter what it is. And the small counties were fighting for large county issues and vice versa. And we were fighting for agricultural and farming issues. And I live in, I live in Broward County, and you know that's not really an issue for us. But we were fighting for it because our counterparts needed that. And in turn, they were fighting with us on the Medicaid retro billing lawsuit and on health care issues because that was the thing that was hurting us the most and water issues. You know, everybody needs clean drinking water. So when I went in with the clean drinking water issue, it wasn't a Republican or a Democratic issue. That's something that affects everybody. So I was fighting for clean drinking water. So that's that's the way that I solved that problem, and that's the way we worked good together. Yeah, when I see how you have conducted your life, it's kind of uh, easy to understand, right, on the diversity and inclusion aspect, because you're, you're a nurse by heart, at the core, in your soul. You're a servant leader. You give. You help. I cannot imagine a nurse, right, receiving a patient and distinguishing whether I take care of you because you're this way or you that way, I'm just going to do this and I'm going to go half fast, and, but in this one I'm going to do 100% of me. That's not how you are. You see the person, you see the, you see the soul. Yes. And so I, I would assume you took that to your public office and you will continue to do that the rest of your life. It is because I think that there's, for me, there's some issues that are just absolute. You absolutely have to represent everybody. Everybody has to have a voice. And when you give people a voice, you find out new things. You find out what really matters. And uh, that has worked for me this whole time. These 13 years that I've been in office um, as a city commissioner, mayor, you know, as the president of the counties. I mean, it has been an unbelievable experience. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I learned a lot, and I learned a lot about being me, staying true to who I am. Because when you get in an elected office, people oftentimes will tell you how you should be. I remember um, when I got into office, I said, I want to take a meeting from anybody. If they ask me, I'm going to take the meeting. And they said, you're crazy. You have to screen these people before they come in here. And I said, no, they put me in office. I'll take a meeting from anybody. And I've always believed in an open door policy. And I think that your elected official has to be accessible. They have to be accountable to you. And they have to tell you why. If they make a decision that you don't agree with, they need to be able to explain it. And I've always lived by that. And I'll continue to do that. How much have you used your intuition when faced with a challenge, a hard decision, a place where you've never been to, you've never experienced this, you've never had the situation, of course, I know that God prepare, life prepares you yes. to where you are. Yes. So you, you've had a lot of challenges in life, but how much is, has intuition been part of your decision-making process when you don't know or you're not certain about the how and you know there's people waiting to see you fail, to criticize, but you still do it anyway. How, how do you tap into your intuition? Uh, from learning. I learned a long time ago, if I don't listen to what's inside me, that typically I, it ends up bad. It ends up on the wrong side. So what I learned to do is to trust my instincts, number one. I learned to not second guess them because when you immediately, when you have a situation and you feel a certain way, there's a reason for that. It was through the airport shootings, through the Hurricane Irma, through the tanker spill, the plane crash, through the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting. Everything that was happening, I was trying to make sure that people had as much information or as much, um, as much as they needed in terms of help. I wanted to give help in the situation. I wanted to make things better. And any time that I had to do that, I just had to trust with my gut feelings because I did the same thing in business. In business, I would have never been successful 
had I not trusted in that. And so I, I learned that no matter what I'm doing, I have to do that. That's, that's key. And, and it keeps you at peace, right? Sleep You're not <laughs> married to the outcome or it's not about you. It's about giving. It's about serving. It's about people, period. Like, you know, you just get up in the morning and, you know, you don't necessarily say, well, I'm going to serve black people today or I'm going to serve Hispanic people today. Oh, and then tomorrow I'll serve white people. No, you have to do what's in the best interest of every group of people at all times. And you have to try to have that healthy balance. You know, you're going to have a certain amount of people that say, oh, I didn't like what you did. And then you'll have people that say, well, that helped me tremendously. And I think that's how you have to stay. You have to keep true to yourself and understand the mission. And that's to help people. I get inspired every second I hear you. And uh, I, I, I want to talk to you about the, the infrastructure improvement projects that you were part of. But I also don't want to forget, if there is a woman listening to us or someone that it's part of a of a PTA, or a it's a it's just a regular person, right? It has no exposure, but every day they wake up trying to do better for the community, something small. But in their heart, they think sometimes they can be impacting the community or the country at, at a higher level and become a mayor. How do they do it? How, how do you wake up and, and say, I'm going to get enough votes in order for me to be a mayor? How, how do a, a regular person, if they actually had that thing, intuition, how do you do it? So for me, my neighbors in my community said, you need to run for office. I said, why? I'm a nurse. I'm a business owner. What could I possibly contribute to that? And my political activism started with those neighbors from the Homeowners Association and from the PTA that were pushing me and saying, you should do this. And I think for any woman that is listening out there, you know, start off getting your feet wet in your Homeowners Association. Go to the PTA meetings. Uh, be active in your community and show people that you care. And I think that I am sitting where I'm sitting now because people knew what was in me, that I really had a passion to help people. And those neighbors of mine who walked and knocked on doors in our community, they believed in me more than I even believed in myself because when we began, I, I never expected that I would win. I never expected that I would be here, sitting here 13 years later, representing people, having the milestones in my political career that I had. And so I would say anything is possible. Even if you desire to, to serve in an elected official capacity, um, start off in your community and then let people get to know you. And once they get to know you, they'll vote for you. So tell us more about the infrastructure bill that you created, and is it still going? Tell us how, 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 how did that come to life? So I was on a show just like this, and it was called MPO Speaks. And we had an open line, and people were listening. And as you know, transportation funding from the federal government and from the state government was cut off a long time ago for us. And we were struggling to create improvements in the road and infrastructure in Broward County. And I was sitting there and I said, for better bus service and better transportation, I think that we should have a transportation surtax. And the people that I was on the show with said, oh my God, that's so bad. That's such a bad word. You should never say tax, right? I said, but a surtax where you add a penny on for transportation would allow us enough money over a 30 year period to have the best system. We could have light rail, we could have more bus service, we could have express bus service, improved bus routes. We could have so much that because people come here and sales tax would be the thing that contributes to it. Well, they said, no, I'm not gonna agree with that. Well, when we were on the online, the votes started coming in. People were like, yes, 
I want to be able to have a drink and catch the bus home. Yes, I want to be able to get from the BB&T Center. And it was so popular that they said, we have to explore this further. So then we made a ballot initiative and we put it on to the ballot and people voted for the surtax. And so what that includes is there'll be um, 30 years. It should generate about $130 billion. Wow. And it would allow Broward County to provide all of those things that we want to provide for people without depending on whether or not the state puts us in their budget or whether the federal government puts us in the budget. And it gives people, it makes our community better for millennials because most millennials do not want a car. I can remember when I was growing up, I kept saying, hold on, I want a car, I want a car. But we have people, young people now, they said, I don't want a car. I want to take public transportation. I want to save some money. They, some people don't even want like what we wanted. I remember going to apply for a job and wanting good benefits, retirement, a car, a house. They're like, no, I'm happy with my life. I don't want to complicate my life. So I thought that this transportation surtax, um, when we brought this forward, we said, well, well, how do we help with minorities with this? So we have a set aside of 30% of that $130 billion for minorities and small business to have them participate in this program. Wow. And what that means is we're going to have a lot more minorities that are becoming primes and running their own business and not having to be subs on all the contracts. And so it, it's a win-win for our community. It is, it is. Uh, and, and this program stays until 30 years. 30 years. And at 30 years, we have the opportunity to vote to renew it or to sunset, which means wow. to end it. Wow. Mm -hmm. So when you talked about creating businesses, um, in, I know you you had a projects that you put out, big projects to help the community. And when you decide what percentage minority, what percentage is set aside for minorities, what, what, are, you, what are you guys thinking? So based on the county, we were able to get to, to understand how many minorities we had that we could give opportunities. So on county contracts, that was somewhere between 18 and 20 percent. We felt like we needed to be ambitious with this proposal. And so I put forth a uh, motion to make a 25 percent um, set aside. And then we, we substituted that for 30% set aside. So that's how it got up to 30%. And so 30% of all these dollars will go to a minority small business. And that's huge that's when we're talking about this. But at the county, how we came up with that is we knew that we had a threshold. So when we got, when we bid projects, we knew that the maximum amount was between 18 and 20%. And we figured if we gave time for minorities to get certified and to get their paperwork together, we could possibly get that up to 30%. And so this is aspirational and it's also doable to yeah. get it to 30. Especially if the, if that's the outcome, there's ways to do it. You know, sometimes some people need some mentorship, some, some people need the access of capital, maybe you pair them with another company. There's, there's, there's multiple ways. ways. to do it. There's, we just need to want to do it. Right. 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 There's always a solution. There's yes. always a way. A way. Um, tell me a little bit about workforce development. I, I, I get have to talk about construction because it's, it's, uh, I guess I, it's part of my passion. And I also, I'm a firm believer construction can give so many opportunities. And when you talk about giving back and helping people, I always think construction is an avenue for someone that is could be in survival, right? They don't know where they're, what they're going to eat, how are they going to do it. And so workforce development, it's a, it's a big word. I've been in many organizations where they try to do this, but it never really happened, materializes. And in the time that we're living now, where there's so much work, and more to come, yes. yet there's not enough people to fulfill the work. How do we bridge that gap? So the first thing that has to happen with workforce development programs is that 
going backwards, you have to understand not everybody wants to go to college. And so you have to have more trade school programs, and then you have to have in workforce development training on the job. And so in Broward, we created a construction trades program where you can get trained on the job to do construction work. The other thing that you have to remember in terms of workforce development is that um, we have to be willing to go the extra mile to help people who may not have all their papers, may not have what they need to work. You have to be able to stop and show them how to get that. Apply for a temporary visa so somebody can have a better life. Um, we have to be willing to do the work that it takes to get people up and running and to give them the opportunity to achieve their dream. I used to say achieve the American dream, but I think that when people come here from other countries, they have their own dreams. So let them achieve whatever it is that they dream, but we have to do our part to help them. That's really what I'm committed to. There's been a lot of issues with racial profiling, people driving and get, being stopped, and then they're being detained because they think that they're Ill, here illegally or they think that they have drugs and they're being treated that way based on their skin color. That has to stop. Oh, that happened to me. <laughs> that happened to me three, three weeks ago in uh, Iowa. I didn't think that existed. And it does. I didn't, uh, wow. To, to, and, and it's very prominent here. Do you know that the arrest rate for a Hispanic and a black person is three times that of a white person? You are six, over 66% more likely to be arrested on a traffic stop and detained in search than a white person is here in the state and in Broward County. That is significant. Those statistics should not exist in that disparity. So we have to do better. That's one of the things that I want to address. The other thing is public education. We have to fund public education. Why? Because working class families, those kids are in public school. If you say, I'm going to fund private schools and I'm going to cut the funding for public schools, it does not allow for equal access to opportunity and the same quality, the same level of education. I want to fully fund public schools. If you choose to go to a private school, that's fine. We can fund education in private schools, but I don't want to fund it at the risk of losing funding for public schools because that's where our future is. Most of the kids in our community go to public schools. We have to make sure that that's done. And then my mother being a retired elementary English teacher, I was so appalled by the fact that they put forth a bill to take away teachers' pensions. Teachers are underpaid already. They're overworked. They have classroom sizes that are too big for them to handle. And then you say, oh, you're going to work your whole career. And by the way, at the end of your career, you won't have a pension. I think it makes no sense. I want to go and fight for teachers. I want to fight to make sure our kids have a proper education. And um, I want to present a bill throughout the state to address rent in increases and the cap rent increases to the cost of living. There's people out there that are experiencing a 30% increase in their rent, 50% um, increase in rent. There's no way that you'll be able to afford the place that you're living if somebody can take up rent like that. And so I'm gonna produce a bill, a statewide initiative for rent caps, for proper notification for tenants if you plan on increasing the rent to give them enough time to find something else which is a minimum of 60 days, and um, to have proper notice. You can't just put a, a note on my door and say, oh, by the way, next month I'm going to increase your rent by 30%. That doesn't work that way. And in order to control the housing crisis and control the problems in Florida, that's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to handle it on a statewide level and also give local governments the tools that they need to fight. And, and, and maybe partner with people, with uh, you know, developers. There's there's people that have their heart in the right place. Maybe partner with people that there's there's always solutions to a to a problem. How do how do we how do we do that? And in terms of education, I I was in an innovation conference. 
um, a month ago. And what I see that is happening in the next five, eight years with the advances in, in AI, machine learning, I don't know if our education system is catching on to the world the way the world will be. What I'm saying is, if you're a plumber and an electrician, you don't have a lot of it to worry about. But if you are in any of the traditional careers, it will be an issue. And so I'm not sure how are we incorporating the advances in, te in technology today to bring our kids to the level that they need to be to be prepared for, for society. What, what do you... So oh, I think that fundamentally, that goes back to funding. See, we've cut so much out of public ed education. We cut the extracurricular activities where kids were getting additional STEM exposure. After school programs have been cut and not funded, teachers have been told, leave as soon as the bell rings because we're not paying you overtime. So it's hard to get the American education system to keep up with the European education or the Middle Eastern education system where they're constantly pushing technology, science, engineering, mathematics. They're constantly pushing to the next level. If we're going to prepare our future leaders to lead this country in a progressive manner with education and technology, we have got to start that now. And that means at the elementary level, we have to continue to fund those programs. And so that's going to be the biggest fight is to have people see value in early education. Um, people think that uh, elementary school is just for the learning, the ABCs and the one, two, threes. No, it's about grooming our future leaders and grooming kids that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is what's going to run this country and adding value to teachers because without teachers, we can't train them and teach the future leaders. And I wouldn't be where I was. I wouldn't have gotten six degrees if I didn't run into a bunch of great teachers. And I think that um, we have to place a higher value on education. Absolutely. Well, I, I think it's a matter of national national uh, security. security. It is. Because we have to stay comp competitive with the world. We don't want to be the one that is learning at a lesser speed. And so I, I think it's, a, it's, it's an important topic. It is. I mean, just look at the world events that's going on right now, Ukraine, with Russia. And to have the superpowers of the world, like the United States, come together with the European Union and to try to fight to protect Ukraine and to keep um, the security of the nation from having a nuclear threat, because that's what it's going to boil down to. And who do you have at the end of that to protect us? You have the scientists, the nuclear engineers. You have the military. You have the America who has, um, we've had the technology to take in the nuclear industry and we, we are able to, um, deter those attacks like what Russia is planning. But if we didn't invest in that part of our infrastructure in America and invest in people, we wouldn't be able to do that. And but those people that are there, that training didn't start when they were little. They got the training after they were adults. And I'm saying if we want the future and we want to move ahead, we have to start that when they're younger. And that that is a matter of national security. We wouldn't have been able to send the most um updating technology to Ukraine. We wouldn't have been able to make tankers that Russia doesn't have. We wouldn't have been able to say we can stop a nuclear attack if we haven't put invested in that part of it and, the, and education is the key to that. Well, I, I am very grateful for the time that you've been here. Um, I always ask, is there something that I didn't ask? Is there something that you want to share with our listeners? And uh, your, your story is inspiring and motivating because being accomplished in all the areas that you have been, as a, and being a mother, you know, 
being uh, having a family, playing all these roles, trying to take care of yourself, selling a, your company, which you, you were super successful. Not everybody gets to that point, which I congratulate you also. Being able to, to rise in the political arena and, and not saying, you're not where like, oh, you know what, this is too difficult. I'm not, you know what, I'm, I'm not doing it anymore. You, you continue to be focused on serving others and helping the community. It's very inspiring. It's uplifting to me because sometimes I am like, but I wanted you to share your last thoughts with the audience and somebody might be listening that needs a little bit of inspiration and motivation. And I'm sure you're the perfect person to do it today. Thank you. That's so humbling. It's really humbling to have you say those things to me. I feel like I've, I, all I want to do is just make sure that I work for people and make sure that they can appreciate the effort that I put in. For whoever is listening out there, what I would say to you is that the thing that keeps me going is the fact that I never give up. I never stop and I never let anybody determine what my level of achievement can be and where I can reach. I think you have to do that for yourself. Thank you and uh, continue to help people. Uh, I'm all about that. How do, how do we help someone? How do we help someone be the best that they can be? Thank you for watching Thriving in Construction, the podcast with Patricia Bonilla. If you enjoyed this episode and you would like to help support the podcast, please share it with others and leave a rating or review on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcast. If you have any suggestions or any related topics you would like us to tackle in our future episodes, feel free to comment down below. Remember to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week here in Thriving in Construction the podcast.